So tonight we, um, we're going to try to bring you in a little bit deeper to some of the technical foundations about uh, how, how particles um, are produced in the early universe, how they might interact uh, in our detector today, and even some of the numbers that will hopefully give you some appreciation um, about why we're excited that you know maybe maybe we're ready for a discovery phase in uh, in dark matter. Um, so this is different from the overview uh, last week. The first part's the same, but as we were writing lecture number two, we kind of rearranged things a little bit. Um, so last week we told you about astrophysical evidence, what the dark matter might be, and a first look at the Lux experiment. Uh, tonight we'll start with a short recap um, and then talk about in the first segment uh, how WIMPs uh, may have been produced in the early universe uh, and what, what the basic parameters are uh, for a WIMP search today, uh, that is WIMPs in the galaxy. Uh, then we'll tell you a little bit about uh, particle detector basics, what are the key particles um, of interest to someone searching for dark matter and how they interact in the detector. And then a little bit with that extended foundation, what Lux in depth looks like, what the data that we're going to take, what, what that might actually look like. So maybe a year from now, we put out a discovery paper and you guys have a look at it and you say, oh yeah, that plot, that's the key plot. So we want you to have an appreciation for what sort of information is going to come out of the, of, the, of the hardware that we've been building and will now operate. By way of recap, uh, last week, uh, we told you about uh, how gravity pulls planets around so that they go in a circular orbit and that gravity falls off as you get further away from the source. And all of this hangs together when you make a, a plot of the speeds of each of the planets as a function from uh, the, the, the center of the solar system. Gravity gets weaker, Newton got it right, and it all hangs together. So we can use the orbits of things to weigh this, to, to determine the strength of gravity and see if that accounts for all the matter that we see. So when we apply that same physics on the scale of galaxies or clusters of galaxies, we find this deficit. And in the, it, for, cluster, for, for galaxies, if we plot the speed of the, of, the, of the luminous objects as sort of test particles that weigh everything inside their orbit, then just like in the solar system, once you're past all the luminous stuff, you would expect things to slow down. The fact that they don't slow down, that they stay up at very large velocities, indicates that there's a missing source. There's something present that is making um, a much stronger, um, uh, a much stronger tug on all of the things that are orbiting. So that's an indication that there's something missing, something different from the luminous stuff. And when we played that same game on a cluster of galaxies, so each, where each of these yellow blobs itself was a galaxy, and they were all bound together from their mutual gravity, we found that objects in the background were lensed, and that you had to, you had to assume that there was a large component of unseen matter that was causing that lensing, that bending of space. So then the other thing we told you, we showed a movie about you know, sort of simulating how dark matter behaved in the early universe in the Big Bang. I want to talk a little bit um, in slightly different terms about the way we think about um, uh, the way the, um, the, the dark matter or any part of particles could have been there in the Big Bang. So the uh, title is The Soup of the Big Bang. So the Big Bang, um, you know, the evidence, the first direct evidence is that galaxies are all moving away from us. And if you think about, let's rewind the clock, Eventually, everything, had, or some early time, must have been all crushed together. And if it was, if it was all crushed together, it was at some point some kind of plasma. And it turns out that we have a very good um, uh, description of uh, if you have a plasma of hot particles, they should, um, it's a plasma, it's glowing, like you know, in the center of a flame. It should have a very characteristic uh, color spectrum, if you will, um, that it'll depend on the temperature. And an example of that is the sun. So this thing is called a black body spectrum. This is data versus um, the, the measurements of the sun. This is wavelength. This is sort of visible light peaked at yellow, and this is the wavelength of the light. And there's, there's a red curve, which is a calculation on basic principles. If the surface of the sun is sort of a plasma, um, 
then it should have so much light, so much uh, light at the, at the various free wavelengths, various colors. And you can see the blue jagged line pretty much follows it. And then the details of the atoms matter a little bit. Some atoms will you know, emit a little bit of radiation preferentially or absorb it. So there's some jaggedness there. But it's remarkable. This is a theory from statistical mechanics. And um, it's actually the principle of these new fangled thermometers that'll measure your kid's ear temperature real quick. It uses that. It tries to see two colors on the, uh, on the light coming from your ear. Your ear's not really a plasma, but it tries to crack for that. Um, so, so basically, th this is a way we can kind of think about these things. Um, <clears throat> another place where we could do this, well, people realized in the 50s if there was a big bang, then by God, it should have had this. Uh, the first calculation of that dates to the 1880s, and um, or the first attempted calculation. And so you could go look for a leftover glow of light from the Big Bang. And uh, in, this, in the 60s, that was seen. And since then, it has been incredibly well measured. And see this shape here that for the sun, and the sun kind of looked like this theoretical calculation of the so-called black body spectrum. This is the leftover light from the Big Bang. And the universe expanding actually takes the light and, 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 and sort of red shifts it to lower energy, longer wavelength. And so that light initially was, was not even quite visible. It was very ultraviolet, very high energy flame, very high energy plasma. Now it's been shifted down to where it's sort of microwaves. And uh, so the wavelength here is in millimeters. And um, here is data and theory overlying each other from a satellite that flew about 20 years ago. And the errors on that data, you, you couldn't even put on this graph. It's actually the best measured black body spectrum of anything in nature. And it fits just absolutely beautifully. And why do I tell you all this? The point is, and this is from a very early time in the universe. The universe was essentially just a hot plasma. That's all it was. There's a lot we know about this, 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 this the, the agreement between our understanding of why a plasma would do that and how it does do that. And it tells us a huge amount about the particles in the Big Bang. And one particular thing we've learned about that hot plasma is that you can have, um, well, something that's really kind of amazing. So I, I'm not sure if you'd ever quite heard. I remember when I was a kid, um, I tell my students these jokes. They don't get it. But remember in Star Trek in the old days, uh, you know, they would have a matter-antimatter engine, right? And uh, the fact is, antimatter is real. There's plenty of antimatter. You can create it all the time. But there's not much of it, actually. I said there's a lot of it. But no, no, I mean, in, in general, there's just tiny, tiny amounts from weird particle interactions. But at early times in the universe, if the average energy of things, which is measured basically by temperature, so kT, um, k is a constant is larger than Einstein's matter energy equivalence uh, that mc squared is, that mass times speed of light squared is, is equivalent to an energy. If the average just energy of stuff thermally, because it's a really high temperature, is bigger than mc squared for some particle that has a mass m, then what you can do is you can spontaneously create matter-antimatter particle pairs, okay? So the early universe was a soup of at really high temperature of all sorts of matter-antimatter particle pairs. So here's, for instance, this is called a Feynman diagram. Uh, this is a positron, an anti-electron, and an electron. And they annihilate, as Spock would say, into pure energy. Um, in this case, a Z boson, which is a, let's think of it as pure energy. It's not exactly, but. Um, and then it will maybe create another electron and an anti-electron pair. Or maybe it'll create some other thing, a proton and an antiproton, or some particle that we don't normally have around today. Um, and this might be the dark matter, the dark matter, anti-dark matter pair. And this reaction is just sort of occurring in equilibrium. And there's a telltale plasma glow from, from this effectively is what's left over here that we see. And so we can kind of infer that this story had to be true the early universe was a soup of matter-antimatter at some incredible density, and uh, that's what it was like. And so in that sort of cauldron, um, if there's other exotic particles that we're trying to create in accelerators today, if those, you know, 
at some early time in the universe, everything was a higher energy than even CERN by a lot. And so that's the thought, is the dark matter came from that. So Tom's described a mechanism whereby if a species exists and there was sufficient energy, you could make it. So if this hypothesis that we have is true, it says the particles could have been made in the Big Bang, right? But the reverse process is also possible. A WIMP anti-WIMP could be produced, but then a WIMP anti-WIMP could also, you know, reconnect or you know, one WIMP and some other anti-WIMP could reconnect and annihilate and turn back into electrons. So just being able to produce these particles in the early universe isn't, isn't enough to complete the story. We have to, we have to de develop an idea of, of could particles also have properties such that they would still be around, such they wouldn't find each other and have just annihilated away shortly after they were produced. So last week we talked about uh, how to think of a force as having a range. And if you're talking about a soup of particles and asking, will they sort of, from their random motions, find each other and collide and interact, then the idea of cross-sectional area is useful. Right? So we could take the idea of the range of a force and just say, well, let's say that that range squared is roughly the cross-sectional area of a particle. So now if two particles are whizzing past each other, and their cross sections are such that they in effect overlap, then they'll interact. And that might simply mean that they scatter, but if two particles come close enough to each other and they happen to be a particle and an antiparticle of the same species, then, then that process of annihilation can go, can go forward. So if particles have a large cross section, then there's a reasonable chance that they'll interact, okay? And to give you a, a, a feel for how this works, so you know, even if you're not a very good shot, in a game of billiards, you've got you know, a table that's about one meter by two meters, and the balls are about three inches in diameter. If you smack the cue ball, even blindfolded, there's a reasonable chance that these balls on this scale will run into each other. Now, imagine if you were trying to play billiards on a football field, again with 15 balls, three inches in diameter, on that scale, the probability of a collision would be very small. Or if you were on a regular billiards table, but the balls were three millimeters in diameter, then a random shot would be that much more unlikely. So if particles in the, these hypothetical WIMPs in the early universe had weak interactions, short range, effectively very small cross sections, then as the universe was expanding, it starts to look like billiard balls on a football field, these particles would have a very small chance of finding each other to annihilate. So now we can say, well, if particles have the right properties, they could be produced, and if they also have the right properties, then they, then they wouldn't annihilate away. They would survive today as relics of the Big Bang. So this gives us, this starts to allow us to sort of hone in on the numerical values for what properties these particles would have to have. They would have to have uh, weak interactions, cross-sectional areas for interacting on the order of 10 to the minus 40 square centimeters, small compared to the cross-sectional area of even a, a nucleus. And they would have to have masses on the order of about 100 proton masses, okay? So we start to get, we start to be able to construct an hypothesis. If nature has particles with these properties, then they should have been produced in this plasma that Tom talked about, and they should have not annihilated away. They should have survived to today for us to, to possibly be able to see. So we take those the particles with the right set of properties to have been produced and not annihilate, and we stick them in our local neighborhood, the Milky Way, and we, we develop this hypothesis to say that WIMPs that would have been produced in the early universe and survived today uh, would be present at the, the density to make up the strength of local gravity, fill out that rotation curve. Uh, we know roughly what their speed should be because just like the solar system, they're orbiting the gravitational center of the galaxy. Um, and so now, um, let's see, let me take you back to this other idea that we mentioned last week, which is that something that has weak interactions 
If you put it through a light year of lead, it would scatter about once. Okay, so that's another way of thinking about the cross-sectional area. Take something that's roughly the density of lead and pass one of these particles through it, and it'll scatter about once per light year. We can put all of this story together to say how many WIMPs per year are going to pass through the LUX detector, and we come up with a number of about 10 to the 16 WIMPs per year. And then, you know, we normally think of the LUX detector about being a half meter across, right? It's also 10 to the minus 16 light years across. That's also a unit of, of length. And so the numbers just about add up. If you had one particle per light year, or you had 10 to the 16 particles per year in 10 to the minus 16 light years, then the numbers work out where you would just expect about a few, ends, a few events per year. So we're arguing that we're building an experiment of about the right scale. There was a release today about the alpha magnetic spectrometer, and that is the most sensitive particle physics spectrometer. Is that what you guys are talking about? How, how do you measure what you're talking about? Right, so we're gonna tell you more about how, how we're going about measuring it, and the, the press release that you saw today uh, is based on the idea that if you got enough, if enough WIMPs and anti-WIMPs collected all in the same place, then you would sufficiently raise the probability that they would find each other and annihilate, just like I was arguing they wouldn't do on average in the early universe. They would annihilate back into normal matter and, and create an excess beyond what we expect from cosmic rays. And this AMS was reporting today that, that they've made a better measurement of this excess than anyone has measured before, and it seems to still persist. Specifically what they saw is uh, a, a lot of anti-electrons. And there are anti-electrons we know from normal astrophysical processes. And the hint that it might be dark matter is there seems to be maybe more than you would account for from other astrophysical processes like supernova and things like that that are exotic that can create anti-electrons. Now we wanted to tell you about the, the key particles and interactions because this is, gonna, this is gonna sort of fill in the story of the thing that we wanna detect but also the things that we need to discriminate against. There are lots of, you know, you build a particle detector and lots of things are gonna interact with it. So you have to understand both the thing you wanna detect and the, thing that is, that the things that are gonna make up the background, the thing that, that could mask the signal. So one of the important ones is just an ordinary gamma ray, something coming from some radioactive atom that happens to be in your detector is unwanted. What happens is that this gamma ray, it, it undergoes electromagnetic interactions. So if it comes sufficiently close to an electron that's in the detector medium, it'll scatter, just like two billiard balls, it'll scatter off of that electron, go off in a new direction with a lower energy, and then that recoiling electron will, will have picked up some kinetic energy, and then um, it will start slowing down, and it'll jostle the medium around it and, and produce some observable energy. So these little arrows are meant to, to, to indicate the energy that this electron just passing through the medium uh, is shedding some of its energy as it, as it travels. And that energy can appear in a couple of different ways. One way that it can appear, the, so now I'm talking about these little arrows, this electron kind of rippling electromagnetically through the medium. It, if it, it, it can jostle the electron of another atom up into some excited orbit. And then when that electron then, you know, fractions of a second later uh, de-excites, that energy will be released as a visible photon. Okay, so same symbol here. This is a very energetic gamma ray. This is something, you know, an, a, a photon from a, an atomic process. So it would be something like near the visible or the ultraviolet, okay? So we would describe this as uh, an atom becoming excited and then de-exciting um, with the emission of a, of a photon. That process is called scintillation, okay? Another thing that could happen is an electron might get knocked completely free from an atom, and that atom would, be, uh, would become ionized, and the electron would then be free to propagate through the detector. So these two processes of scintillation uh, and ionization 
are, are sort of the key underlying microphysics of how things lose energy in the detector and, and possibly give you a signal to measure. Okay. Another particle that we, that we worry about is the neutron. So a neutron um, is a, it weighs about the same as a proton. Um, it, uh, it doesn't directly undergo electromagnetic interactions. Um, so it won't scatter from the electrons uh, around an atom. But if it gets close enough to a nucleus, and, and that would happen about every 10 centimeters of travel, it will strike the nucleus, give it enough energy to kick it right free from its electrons. That nucleus is now charged. It's positively charged. It, it slows down through the medium, also generating the same type of excitations. Okay. Now, the neutron can scatter again, and this is an important thing that distinguishes it from a WIMP. It can scatter off of another nucleus some 10, 20, 30 centimeters away and give us an independent excitation of, of a similar type. Now the WIMP, the WIMP would undergo uh, the same sort of, of interaction as a neutron. Of course, it will travel very long distances. Most WIMPs would just travel right through the detector and not interact at all. But when a WIMP did interact, it would also kick a nucleus right out of its atom and generate, again, the same sorts of excitations that, that we've shown here. So now let me just talk a little bit about the different types of detectors people have built. This is a, uh, like this is out, I think it's, it serves as a museum piece out on a lawn, I think maybe at Fermilab. Um, this is a sphere of steel, and inside of it, there was pressurized liquid. And what you do is um, uh, you suddenly depressurize the liquid, and it's just like you uh, shake the, a coke up and you're about to pop it. And um, it turns out in that microsecond after you start to pop it, if your coke can were completely smooth and there were no imperfections anywhere, the, the liquid would just sit there in a ready to bubble state, but you need some little place to nucleate the bubbles. And then what can happen is particles come along, energy is deposited, all the excitations Dan would talk, was talking about, that energy can nucleate the bubbles. and. Uh, uh, Don Glazer, who was, I think, an undergrad here at Case, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nobel Prize for inventing the bubble chamber. There's this apocryphal story that he was studying his beer glass when he got the idea. <laughs> he, he denied it. Here's a, a chamber where uh, particles from a beam have come in. Uh, there was an interaction there, and a whole bunch of particles came out. And you're watching the track of these particles. This was at fairly high energy from an accelerator, higher than the energies we have in looking for WIMPs. And, and you can't really tell it, uh, but these, these, what, the black is, is a trail of bubbles. And those bubbles are going to keep growing, but that's that first second after they first were created. And they, they would synchronize the depressurization of the chamber with the beam of particles coming in with a photograph. And that's bubble chamber. So that was an old style, that was one of the original sort of powerful detectors. Now, here's, this is just a piece of, um, this is a detector based on scintillation. So as Dan mentioned, there's certain materials where when the atoms de-excite from this high energy smash they got, they, they glow in the visible. And those are pieces of plastic scintillator and they're glowing a little bit in a blue light because there's particles hitting them all the time. And you would then have to attach some sort of photon sensors to it, but this is just the scintillator bare, okay? And if you want, you can go to the right scientific catalog and order this stuff, put it in your desk. Um, this is a different style of detector. This is a ultra pure piece of germanium. It's actually not a very impressive photo in a way, but it's actually from a cutting edge, low background experiment that's ongoing right now. Um, <clears throat> it's made of germanium, which is a cousin of silicon, which is all the semiconductor stuff that's in your computer. Um, it has the property that if you put a high voltage across it and you create, and you knock electrons off of the germanium atoms, you can actually measure them as a little electrical blip. And you see the, um, the wires there that go out to some readout electronics. And um, so that's another just standard style of particle detector. And mostly these ionization detectors you think of as being silicon or germanium, or gases or liquids of, of noble elements. Combining these two sorts of elements primarily, um, you can build very, very complicated detectors. So that's the Atlas detector at the LHC, and it's got millions, literally, of various elements of detector that are of that style or that style all arranged in a very complicated way 
to contain these very complicated events um, that are created in these, you know, in the, in the accelerator where all these particles come out. What we do looking for dark matter is comparatively simple compared to that, but I'm going to stand it back to Dan at this point. Okay, so we wanted to shift gears a little bit now, kind of hopefully giving you a flavor of where the particles come from, how they interact, the flavors of particle that makes up the signal, the WIMP, and the other particles that make up um, the background. And it, the, and the backgrounds, we have to think about two different ways. We're going to tell you a little bit more uh, in part three about what the signal looks like um, in the detector. But there's so much background that if we just built the detector, being able to tell between signal and background, if you've got a billion background events per signal event, they just the detectors don't work well enough. You've got to still take other measures to, to try to minimize the amount of background events that are going to be present. Uh, so you can think of it as sort of a multi-layered defense. So one of the things um, that you should be asking yourself is, hey, those neutrons interacted in the detector a lot like WIMPs. So we have to be concerned about neutrons. They won't also always scatter twice. It's a statistical process. So we have to be concerned about anything that would put neutrons near the detector. And one of the things that will do that is high energy cosmic rays, so these high energy particles from space, will occasionally interact with a nucleus, cause that nucleus to undergo a process called spallation, which is kind of goes splat. That's kind of an easier way to think of it. And one of the things that can pop out of a nucleus would be a neutron, and then that neutron could scatter in the detector and lead to potentially a background event. So, so it's these cosmic rays that we have to get rid of. If you tried to do an experiment at the surface of the Earth, it would be the environment would just be way too noisy. There would be such a high rate of these particles uh, that that would be bad. And so this is why we're in this um, home state gold mine a mile underground in South Dakota, so that most of the cosmic ray muons will simply slow down and stop long before they get to the, the cavern where the experiment is housed. So the, the muons with a mile of Earth will come down by a, about a factor of 10 million. So the, the few that are left might produce um, neutrons. And so we take a second measure, uh, which is that we, we take the detector, and, and it's housed inside a water tank. Well, the water's not in the tank yet. But so just in this cartoon over here, picture the detector and then it's in about an eight, eight meter diameter water tank. Any neutrons that, that still do get produced or come from radioactivity in the rock will have to penetrate the water to reach the detector. And the nice thing about water is that it's got hydrogen in it. And so there's a very favorable kinematic process for a neutron to slow down. A neutron hits a proton and a hydrogen atom in the water and on a typical collision gives up about half of its energy. They're very, very well matched because they're about the same mass, just like, just like balls on a billiard table. So this combination of being deep underground and being inside a water tank is enough to bring down the flux of neutrons. Now I want to talk about how we shield from gamma rays. So gamma rays, um, most radioactivity gives gamma rays about a one in a hundred thousand radioactive decays, maybe one in a million radioactive decays, you get neutrons. The neutrons are more troublesome, but they're much less common. The gamma rays are less troublesome, but they're much more common. And gamma rays just are absolutely coming out of everything. So right now, my body is getting struck about a thousand times a second by gamma rays. And part of it is coming out of you all, and partly I'm, I'm irradiating you. But mostly it's from the cement. This is a cartoon, I'm showing a little video of um, simulated data, but the, this is, we've, we, we understand very well how gamma rays propagate. So if I, this water tank that the detector is surrounded in, um, I'm showing a meter of water, I've started simulating gamma rays and they, I, I, I fire them to the, to the right, and you see that they, these, these trajectories are kind of kinky. This, it'll scatter a bunch of times and lose a little bit of energy, lose a little bit of energy, and then finally get absorbed. And you can see that most of these gamma rays are getting stopped in a meter. And I've picked the, sort of the highest energy, most penetrating gamma rays that you get from radioactivity. And um, that's what we're seeing. Um, if you simulate, I'll let the cartoon go. If I simulate that energy in a meter, you see I kind of just put all the tracks up so you kind of get an idea. 
somewhat lower energy, somewhat lower energy, they don't go as far. So, okay, so a lot of water is, is fine, and in fact, you know, we have about three meters of water between us and this huge amount of radioactivity outside. So it's stopping neutrons and it's stopping gamma rays. Then the xenon itself, um, nice heavy liquid. If you have liquid xenon, actually um, aluminum will float in it. Um, and I, I, we, we maybe didn't mention this week, but our detector is made out of liquefied xenon. Mentioned it last week. And you know, xenon is a noble element. There's helium, neon, argon, uh, krypton, which is radioactive, xenon. So we make the detector out of xenon. And so these gamma rays don't go very far in xenon. So showing the little video of the same type of, same energetic gamma rays uh, uh, what, doing their thing in xenon. And in fact, if you, if you look at the higher energy and then a somewhat lower energy and then uh, gamma rays that are down at the energy close to what a WIMP would do, this is a meter again, ah, they're just stuck there. So this kind of, the, our, our whole overall approach to getting rid of radioactivity is sort of twofold shielding. The water, most of the radioactivity is outside. Then this whole thing that houses the detector has a little bit of radioactivity in it. The xenon is mostly made very, very pure. And so the residual radioactivity from the housing around the detector is pretty effectively shielded by the xenon itself. And we'd like the xenon to be meters thick. Of course, it's a million dollars a ton, and we have about a third of a ton, because that's all we could afford at the time. Uh, we're contemplating a 10 ton, a seven ton detector. But, so we do a pretty good job of then rema removing the res remaining radioactivity through she self shielding. WIMPs were formed, and what sort of apparatus would you need to detect them in a 50% chance in a year? Is that right? Yes. But the other hypothesis is that they don't exist. Right. How long would you have to run this experiment before you were convinced that? It's the other hypothesis is right. One well, year, I'm, five I'm only going to do them until my retirement age, and then I'm going to stop. Uh, no, but there has to be some certain yeah. plot here. What, what's well, a 95% certainty? Yeah, the, so there, the, we have a problem here, which is that and we might may have, in, in the interest of clarity, you know, there's an uncertainty relationship between truth and clarity, and I may have erred too far from truth to, to try to aim for clarity. So we made the story sound fairly simple in terms of what rates to expect. Unfortunately, the story is much more complicated. And there's this other ilk of, th of physicists called a theorist. And the theorist says to you, Dan, Tom, you guys should do this experiment with 10 tons of xenon, or 10 kilograms of xenon, because you might see something. And you do the experiment, and you don't see it. And they go, you know, it might just be like you need another factor of 100 sensitivity. So we've been sort of working through this parameter space where this new brand of particle physics called supersymmetry, it's actually 30 years old. We haven't discovered it yet, but it's one of the things that hopefully comes out of the LHC. So, you know, that looks like a very promising source of you know, theoretical ideas that would lead to a specific candidate that could be the WIMP. And you know, we have a name for it, and this is its range of properties and all that. Well, we're, we're pretty much close to the end of the line on where supersymmetry could provide a WIMP. So you go down the hall to your theorist friends and they say, you know what, we have another idea. There's no bottom to this thing, right? There's no theoretical prediction that says if you take it this far, you build your 20 ton detector and you don't see anything, then you're done. In fact, what's going to happen is that if we don't see anything, we build this 20 ton detector, what's gonna start to happen is that there are gonna be irreducible backgrounds from neutrinos Neutrinos, which is the most dominant one, yeah, it's atmospheric the neutrinos. atmospheric neutrinos, will start to show up in the detector and not be distinguishable from WIMPs. And at that point, you'll say, you know, I can't make the haze go away anymore. And nature didn't cooperate and produce a WIMP that we could have found before this other background uh, starts to show up. I mean, just, just to flush the thought out, we think we know how many WIMPs there are but we don't know how small they effectively are. So if we put out a one ton detector and don't see anything, it could be they're just 10 times smaller than we thought. So then you need a 10 times bigger detector to see them. And we had a rough range of sizes, but that rough range of sizes was already, it had spanned about a factor of 100,000 to start. We're about halfway through it. We as a field in the last 30 years. So we're trying to get the rest. But, he, but then there are theorists, friends, who say, oh no, no, it wasn't uncertain to 100,000, it was uncertain by 10 million. If you said, you know, we'll only be able to detect the first three orders 
on a log plot that's got 50 orders, then you might never even start. And it's important to, to try and see if it's there, we think. Yeah. There, there are far crazier things to look for. From notes from, from a previous class, I have, uh, it says 15,000 dark particles per square meter. Was that a bad note? Or it seems like there'll be far fewer, aren't they? Say it again, 15? 15, 15,000 dark matter particles per square meter. No, 15,000 per... Yeah, something yeah. wrong, I, I yeah, wrote, I wrote I, down. Yeah, that doesn't sound right. Okay. Yeah. It's more yeah. like a, it's a, it's also a billion, would be per it's a billion per square meter passing through, but they're moving fast. In a liter, there's about one, but then they're, they're whizzing nearly the speed of light, so it adds up to, in a square, in a square meter, about a billion. In a liter, on average, there'll be one at a time, mm -hmm. but going right through. So the, there, I put up this number before about the number going through the detector per year. Uh, it was per second and per year. So if you take a volume of stuff that has this many particles in it, and you say, you know, space is all filled with that per unit volume, and then that, that unit of volume is moving at whatever speed, then you could put those numbers together to say, well, there are this many passing through a surface per unit time. You could sort of think of that as a beam. If you have rain and it's raining and the rain's falling very, very fast, you still might only have one raindrop in a certain volume, but the amount of rain that's sitting in the surf ground depends how fast it's going. And these things are moving really fast. You had talked about how gamma rays from the outside would stop in the first several centimeters of xenon. The xenon itself, doesn't have any natural radioactivity, but one up from it in the periodic table um, is, is the element krypton, and krypton has a radioactive isotope. And because the krypton is gonna be dissolved in the xenon, uh, we have to worry about it. It's not, you know, since it's throughout the volume, if you've got krypton, you know, the krypton that's dissolved in the inner part of the detector, when it undergoes its radioactive decay, that is potentially a source of background. So Krypton-85 undergoes a process called beta decay. It decays to rubidium-85, emits an electron and a neutrino. And that little electron looks just like the electron that you get from a scattering gamma ray or something like that, right? So it's the same, once the electron has been produced by that decay, it's just another source of background. Gamma rays are coming from the outside, they'll stop, but this is a little time bomb dissolved throughout the detector waiting to, um, waiting to get you. So it can't be removed using the normal chemical reactive techniques. Uh, it can't be self-shielded. It comes in the xenon that we purchase, um, and it's a danger to us. So what we've developed is a system of charcoal chromatography uh, to remove the krypton but keep the xenon. This is a sort of a separate process that we built in our lab here. And the way chromatography roughly works is that there are different species. So this is you know, using the idea that if you have ink made of different dyes and you put them on a piece of filter paper and you, and you wet the paper, the water will, will cause the different size pigment, bits of pigment to travel at different speeds and, and thus spread them out. So the idea being that uh, if you had a way to move xenon and krypton at different speeds, then you could use that process of chromatography to separate them. And the way we do that is in a, in a column of charcoal, uh, we, we inject the xenon and we drag it through the charcoal with helium gas. So the helium sort of plays the role of the, of the water um, on this filter paper, keeps things moving along. The krypton exits the charcoal first, we throw it away, we recollect the xenon. We carried this process out in our lab. We processed some 400 kilograms uh, over a period of about three months, scrubbing all the, all the krypton. So this was sort of a completely extra measure that we had to, to carry out to get rid of this uh, dissolved krypton. Those of you that were here last week will recognize this cartoon. In the interest of time, I'm gonna go through it quickly, xenon atom gets struck by a wimp, a flash of light, and some electrons are freed. The electrons travel up, and when they hit the gas, they'll produce a second signal. And Tom's gonna talk about how we combine these various signals 
uh, to, to, to put together some knowledge about the underlying particles. So given that cartoon, um, I want to actually show some data from the detector. So we've run the detector once for a couple of months. Uh, it was on the surface before we got to move underground. And um, we're just now starting to take data from, the, from which we might see the dark matter. This is some of the early data. Uh, so this was the cartoon. That's when you know, there was an event right here where a xenon atom was struck, light went out, and there's these arrays of sensors that were in that last movie. Um, here's a photo actually of the sensor. So this is about a two foot diameter cylinder, about two feet tall, two feet tall. And you're looking up in it and you see this kind of honeycomb array of, uh, those are photomultiplier tubes, light sensors. They can see single photons. Um, here's the, uh, and, and, and sorry, and we said that the time difference between the first flash and the second flash gave us the, because we know how fast the electrons move through the liquid. We get the, the time difference gives us the depth. Well, here's real data. So um, on, on this, moving sideways here, we're just seeing the signal in a bunch of, in all these array of PMTs. And you see these, this vertical thing is the, sort of how much light was seen. Uh, um, uh, there's some 120 different um, sensors, light sensors, photomultiplier tubes. And then about 200 microseconds, 200 millionths of a second later, which for electronics is a long time, um, uh, there was a second flash of light from the electrons that got out. And um, that flash of light, looking at this top array of detectors, um, was sort of localized right here. And so from the time difference, we get the depth of the event. And from the localization in this, uh, you know, the, the, that it was really bright right there, we sort of knew that this event was, say, somewhere like there in the detector. Okay, and so we can find out in X, Y, Z, exactly where the event was. That's kind of a holy grail in particle detector technology. Most of the detectors, the scintillator and the piece of germanium I showed you in the previous transparencies, they did not tell you anything about where the event was. And mostly when you want to get where the event was, you have to make little pixels. This is a beautiful technology because in one big unified vat that can be very clean and quiet, you can still figure out exactly where the event was. Now let me talk a little bit more about there is a difference between the WIMPs and most background, and Dan kind of went through this. Um, most background is from gamma rays, and the gamma rays kick an electron, as Dan talked about. What does that look about? What does that look like in detail? Um, the gamma ray strikes right here. This is a simulated event. We know enough about them that we can kind of, in, a, in, a, in computer code, we can simulate exactly what's going on in a microscopic uh, detail. All of this is happening in, a, in an area that it's about 1% the width of a human hair. Let me remove that. And, that, and the electron kind of went around, it hit something and scattered and meandered and finally stopped. And the blue dots are every place there was something that was either going to give us some light or had an electron ripped off of an atom. A nuclear recoil of about the same energy eh, kind of looks similar except more often the whole nucleus will smack another atom and you'll get a second sort of nucleus moving. And, but you see kind of this branching structure. And again, the blue dots are where you got something that gave you a signal. The thing is, is that nuclear recoil is tiny, tiny, tiny. All of this fits into a little box about yay big, okay? So the electron recoil is this kind of spread out thing and the nuclear recoil is this really dense thing. So what does that do for us? In the chaos created by the track, there's these excited atoms that scintillate, the first flash of light, and they also knock off electrons, and those come up and give us a second flash of light. And depending on whether you had a really sort of dense track in this tiny little region or this spread out track, you get more or less of the light versus the electrons. And so from the ratio of the two, we can kind of try to see the difference between uh, you could tell the difference between electron uh, sorry, gamma ray backgrounds and the WIMPs alone, or possibly neutrons. So finally, what, what, what it will look like by it, I mean, if we start to see dark matter, okay? Um, this is a map of exactly how much uh, gamma, external gamma backgrounds we expect in a given location in the detector. So this is the dead center, and this is going out sideways, and this is going up. Red is bad, blue is good. Um, 
So, you know, the edges are really hot, lots of radioactivity. The center is quite clean. If you can read the scale, it's about 100,000 uh, times cleaner, less fewer events in the center than the edges. And so the characteristic of the background is we should see it happening sort of in that pattern. The WIMPs, if we see a sprinkling of them, they should be absolutely uniform. You know, there's, there's no, there's no there's, they're not going to be at the edges. And then finally, <clears throat> we will make a plot like this. This is the amount of charge divided by the amount of light. Electron recoils have more charge than light. I've colored them in in blue. When we take our real data, we won't be able to put a color on them. But they'll appear here on this plot. This is the energy of the event. And we know about how much energy a WIMP should deposit. It's down, down at low energies. This is fairly low energies. That's about the energy of actually x-rays. You go get a medical x-ray. Each x-ray is about as much energy as this. Um, these nuclear recoils, which are happening at a lower uh, position on this, on this, you know, and in this charge divided by light ratio, would be down here. Some number of these would be from neutrons that we somehow weren't able to get rid of after all, all our shielding. But neutrons uh, will absolutely, more often than not, have scattered twice. And if they do, we'll remove them. And in fact, if there's a, some residual, a few remaining that didn't, we'll actually know about exactly how many there were, because the vast majority of them will have scattered twice. And our detector sees if something bounces twice, we image it as two separate events. So we're going to get rid of those. And at that point, if we have some events here, in addition to the events that are there, we're going to say, aha, they're WIMPs. And um, we would expect only a handful with the current detector in about a year. But we could run for several years, and we might get a good handful. And it will really depend on their size. Um, that is about the maximum we could expect, given how the non-observation and detectors, previous generation detectors that were somewhat smaller than our detector, if we ran for a few years and they were just below the limit of what had not been seen at the other detectors in terms of how big they were and therefore how often they were interacting. And in this detector, we're going to be able to see something between something like that and none. And then if we want to have another shot at it, we want to build a detector that's essentially 100 times more sensitive. And then we can look for another factor of 100 in the rate of those things, and so on and so forth. And one, one thing I would just add is this, this plot looks you know, sort of fairly sparse. And we kind of designed it as such to show you what the final, final data would look like. But when we do calibration, we can bring up a source of gamma rays from the outside and really thicken the blue band and, and verify that, oh yeah, just, just as we had said, this is where gamma rays showed up. And we take the gamma source away and bring up a source of neutrons, hold it close to the detector for a little while. And that will really fill in this red band. So we're going to get to study in great detail with artificial sources how these two bands are populated. Then we take all that away, and then we just quietly wait and see if it gets filled in. So that was yeah. all I wanted to add. Yeah. yeah. OK. Thanks again. OK.